Hello. So now that you have a good handle on the biology of human reproduction, we'll take a look at the interface between that biology and culture. <coughs> Excuse me. The intersection of biology and culture is where we see the major variation in the number of children that women have. So fertility. Species need um, reproduction to survive, as you know. This is, this is an absolutely essential part of human existence and evolution. And this is why cultures have probably forever been extremely fascinated with fertility. We have fertility goddesses. We, we have religions that control uh, women's reproduction. I mean, fertility is where it's at. It's kind of the, the, the essential part of humanity because it is, in many ways, also <laughs> the essential part of evolution. We've seen that fascination for a long time. You may remember when we uh, talked about the Venus of Willendorf. Uh, this is that small little you know, four and a half um, inch high statue. Dates from about 25 to 28,000 years ago from, Aust um, from Austria. And it's thought that uh, perhaps this is representative of, of a woman that someone had carved of a, of a, of a woman uh, or a, a fertility goddess, or perhaps these, uh, these Venus statues were actually sculptures that women carved of themselves while they were pregnant. And this, this picture always has stuck with me um, of a woman looking down at her own pregnant body. Um, and it's the same, the same perspective as you would see with the Venus of Willendorf. So fertility, um, variation in fertility, we are obsessed with this. Now to study this from a scientific perspective though, we need some terminology to add on to the reproductive biology that you already have in hand. So some terms to know. Fertility. Fertility is the production of a live birth. So this is marked by a birth. Fertility stands in contrast to a concept, um, the concept of fecundity. And fecundity is the biological capacity to reproduce. It is a theoretical potential. So a person can be fecund, but they are not fertile until they have actually produced a live birth. Fecundity is crucial to fertility. Fecundity, fecundity interacts with various behavioral processes to determine the level of fertility that a person reaches. Parity is the number of births. So the parity of a person, of a woman could be one or two or 10. The fertility rate now adding on to fertility, the fertility rate is the number of children a woman has had over the entire course of her reproductive life. This is the total number of children born to her. Let me also introduce you to two other concepts, natural fertility and controlled fertility. Now natural fertility natural fertility, it, a natural fertility population has um, they have a few different characteristics between them. So a natural fertility population, when they're, when somebody is in a natural fertility population, they do not practice birth control, but even more so, a natural fertility population doesn't think that you can, or perhaps they know that you can, but they don't think that you should. Or perhaps they may want to control their fertility, but they do not have access to the means through which to do this. So people living in a natural fertility population will not have an answer to the question, hey, how many kids do you want to have? To them, children just happen. And the number of children that you have is not something that the parent has a say in. In some ways, it's easiest to understand what a natural fertility population is by thinking about when a natural fertility population moves to being a controlled fertility population. So a population leaves natural fertility when a large fraction of couples believes that control is possible, 
believes that control is morally acceptable, believes that control is desirable, gains access to effective methods of birth control, and that couples exert control in accordance with their achieved parity, so, which in turn implies that they have conscious norms about what represents a desirable family size. So a controlled fertility population will be able to answer the question, hey, how many children do you want? And the people living in that population, they make an effort to adjust their risk of pregnancy accordingly. So this can be through birth control or through timing of when they do and do not have sex. Now let's look at some data on the to total fertility rates for both controlled and natural fertility populations. Here, you were looking at two histograms. On the x-axis is the total fertility rate, starting with zero children on average per woman in that population, up to 10 children on average per woman in that um, on the far right of that. The y-axis shows you the number of populations that have that total fertility rate. Controlled fertility populations are indicated by the histogram outlined with the dashed lines, and the natural fertility populations are indicated by the histogram with the solid lines. So this study looked at the total fertility rate for total, total fertility rates for 140 populations, 70 of them controlled fertility and 70 of them natural fertility. The mean fertility rate and the variance for those, those groups are shown here as well. The first thing that likely jumped out at you from these data is that women living in a natural fertility population tend to have many more children than women who live in a controlled fertility population. Six versus two and a half. Also, notice that the variance is much higher across natural fertility populations, with some populations have a fertility rate just below four and others with a fertility rate of seven, eight, or even ten. Now the controlled fertility populations average two or three, and one or two of them average four uh, children per woman. So that variance is, is much um, more reduced compared to natural fertility populations. Even though these two states of fertility differ significantly in their total fertility rates, there are some things they have in common, and I want to show you one of them. So here you are looking at four different graphs. On the left-hand side are the natural fertility populations. There's four of them. And on the right-hand side are controlled fertility populations. Again, also four of them. In the top pair of graphs, you're looking at births per 100 married women. And in the natural fertility population, that starts out pretty high uh, um, when a woman is in her between 20 and 25 years of age, and then that decreases to um, a much lower number, far below 100, uh, by the time you get into that age category of 45 to 100. In the controlled population, similarly, you have that decline, but notice for the natural fertility population, um, it is this more uh, um, convex shape to the dis to the to that rate of decline, and then it's more of a concave uh, shape to that, that decline in the controlled fertility populations. And you can see this, um, this decline happening um, a little bit more easily when you look at an adjusted rate. So here, an adjusted rate for both natural fertility populations on the left-hand side and controlled fertility populations on the right-hand side. So notice that both of them have that decline in fertility um, that happens over, over the age of a woman but that the difference between them is the shape of that decline um, and so it is more convex or more concave depending on whether it's natural or controlled fertility and one of the things that this indicates is that in controlled fertility populations women reach their their maximum desired number of children earlier in their reproductive lifespan and so then they dramatically decrease the number of children that they have in their later, um, later stages of their reproductive lifespan. Now let's explore how controlled and natural fertility populations differ 
more substantially from each other and how that actually happens. How does culture come into play in a more detailed and nuanced way rather than just in these concepts of ideal number of children? To understand the interplay between biology and culture, we need to know what the proximate determinants are what components in the biology of human reproduction influence how many children a woman has. So proximate means the immediate causes, and this differs from the ultimate causes, which would be the physiological and the evolutionary causes. So the proximate determin determinants of, of natural fertility are one, Age at menarche. So, when does a woman have her first um, her first ovulatory cycle? When does she experience her first menses? The age at marriage. Now, we're getting into a field called demography, and we'll talk a lot more about demography in the next video. But it's important to 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 know how demographers use some of these terms. So, demographers would use will use the term marriage, not necessarily meaning that there has been this ceremony and rings exchanged and, and you know, man and wife, but marriage meaning when a woman is regularly having sexual intercourse. So marriage is used as a proxy term for regularly having sex. So age at marriage, so when does a woman um, become up at significant risk of becoming pregnant um, because she is having sex regularly, i.e. age at marriage. Then there is the waiting time to conception. How long does it take when she starts having sex to when she, she conceives? And we've seen that you know there's variation in that and you only have an 85% chance of becoming pregnant if you're regularly having sex in your early 20s. Then there is the time added by fetal loss if there is a miscarriage, which we know is extremely common, um, that um, a miscarriage does not add to your fertility, but it uh, adds the time um, that you're waiting again to conception. So it's, it's lost time in the calculation of that total fertility rate. Then there's length of gestation, the nine months it takes to gestate a human baby. There is duration of lactational infecundability, do you remember that term, lactational infecundability? So this term refers to that period when a woman is breastfeeding and her prolactin levels are high enough that it keeps suppressed the um, the progesterone in her body, the f um, the f um, the the follicle stimulating hormone and the the luteinizing hormones, and so then she's not in her ovulatory cycle, and then cannot become pregnant because she's not ovulating. So lactational infecundability. When a woman is intensely breastfeeding, she is um, much less likely to be to be ovulating, and therefore much less likely to become pregnant. And then lastly, there is age at menopause or age at the onset of permanent sterility. So when does she reach the end of her reproductive lifespan and is then free to go do other things, worry free of her menses and getting pregnant. <laughs> so these are the proximate determinants of natural fertility. Now we need to think about these um, a little bit more in um, detail because they are not all equally influenced by culture by any means. So some of these proximate determinants, they're biologically set. Cultural variation doesn't influence age at menarche um, or the time added by fetal loss or the length of gestation or age at menopause. And in fact, length of gestation, there's very little variation in that across women. But I do want to note that while there is there's very little variation in, in age at menopause or age at menarche, that we that there is um, there there is a, a an increase um, uh, I'm sorry, a decrease in um, the age at menarche that's happening these days. So girls are starting to be younger on average when they start menstruating. Now studies of, of um, 
studies of this phenomena of this this younger age at, at menarche are linking that younger age to exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals that mimic hormones in the body. And you just learned about these uh, in the previous um, experience uh, with the work of Dr. Tyrone Hayes um, and others. There's um, Increasingly, we're seeing that there is an effect of um, bisphenol A um, and earlier sex sexual maturity that's occurring in, in lab animals and also that we're seeing an association with lower sperm counts. But it's also um, in decreasing that age in menarche as well. So some of these are changing um, in recent times. So now, Knocking out age at menarche, time added by fetal loss, length of gestation, age at menopause as these proximate determinants that culture doesn't really have an effect on, that these are kind of just biologically set. That means then that culture mostly has an influence on these three other proximate determinants of natural fertility. So culture influences um, there's a far greater influence on age at menarche, on the waiting time to conception, and on the duration of lactational infecundability. So these are the proximate determinants that primarily lead to variation in the total fertility rate. So now let's map these out on a graph so we can get a better sense of how they, they um, play out over the course of a woman's reproductive life. So this graph plots out six theoretical women's reproductive lives under different cultural settings. Across the horizontal axis is time, years of a woman's reproductive life. So it starts at 15 years on the left and it ends at 50 years on the right. The graph is labeled so that we can see when a woman marries and is thereby having sexual intercourse regularly, her conception and then birth those are nine months, and that's indicated by the solid black bar. The heavily shaded area after birth represents the amount of time that she's breastfeeding. So she then returns to regular, um, her regular ovulatory cycle after that, but then has a waiting time to her next conception. So that darker shaded area after birth is that lactational infecundability that's obviously related to her breastfeeding practice. And then we have the onset of permanent sterility um, at the end of that lightly shaded, um, the, the lightly hatch, um, hatched area um, at the end. And this is when she is then unlikely to become pregnant. This is assumed for the purposes of this graph to be in her early 40s. Let's focus on the top row first. The pattern that you see here is fairly typical for um, a woman's reproductive life in a Western economically wealthy culture. She marries in her early 20s and about a year later has a child. She nurses the baby briefly. She then waits two to three years and then has a second child. Again, breastfeeding for a brief time. She then has no more children. She's done, despite the fact that she has this, this time of fecundity when she theoretically could um, um, be fertile, but uh, she's done. <laughs> she has reached her maximum number of children that she would like to have, and her total fertility rate is two. Her TFR is two. The next example um, is uh, shows a typical woman during European times. Sorry, my notes are crazy <laughs> behind you. Uh, so the next example down shows a typical woman in Europe during historical times, such as the 19th century in, in the United Kingdom. This woman married later in life, um, usually in her later 20s, and she soon after had her first child. And then she repeatedly became pregnant over the next dozen years. She typically had her last child sometime around when she turned 40. The space between children, what we call the interbirth interval, was about two years, and her total fertility rate is six. In non-Western countries, the next example down, a woman usually marries much younger, um, but she ends her childbearing years around the same time as the woman in historical European times. However, her total fertility rate is seven, just one above the historical European example. What's different? 
notice that the dark shading indicative of breastfeeding, that like that time of lactational infecundability, that extends for a much longer period of time for her. This woman experienced that much longer um, lactational infecundability as a consequence. So her interbirth interval is longer than what the woman in historical Europe um, experienced. So we're going to come back to this graph in a few minutes, but I want you to focus your attention now on the very bottom of this um, of this graph. So. This, at the very bottom, is the theoretical maximum. If a woman were to max out her fertility, having her first child at 15, and shortening her inner birth interval as much as possible, and extending her fertility until she is 50 years old, assuming that she is one of the very rare women who can continue to conceive so quickly, so late in her reproductive, um, in her reproductive years. Now, under this scenario, the theoretical maximum total fertility rate is 31. That's a lot of kids, but I know of no examples of this in real life. The highest fertility rate that I know of is of the Dugar family. Jim Bob and Michelle Dugar have 19 children, and as they explain on their website, Quote, they asked God to bless them with as many children as he saw fit in his timing. And that's kind of the definition of natural fertility. But notice that even in this best case scenario for fertility, they didn't even come close to 31. Now, let's look at some examples of natural fertility populations, um, including here in the United States. And we're going to learn a little bit about these cultures, these um, about the cultures of these populations, and see how that influences their total fertility rates. And so I'll pause um, and end this video here, and I'll pick back up in just a minute. <laughs> 